सो हाई गाइज माई नेम शिवम राय करेंटली आई एम स्टडिंग इन गौतम बुद्धा यूनिवर्सिटी ग्रेटर नोएडा उत्तर प्रदेश इंडिया करेंटली आई एम परसुइंग माई मास्टर्स इन अप्लाइड केमिस्ट्री एंड राइट नो आई एम डूइंग माई डिजर्टेशन इन सी एस आई आर ने स्टार्ट न्यू दिल्ली वेयर आई एम लर्निंग अबाउट द बेसिक टेनेट्स ऑफ बिप्लोमेट्रिक एनालिसिस साइंटोमेट्रिक डूइंग माई रिसर्च ऑन इलेक्ट्रोकेमिकल कार्बन डाइऑक्साइड प्रोडक्शन uh so this is a topic uh, which i was introduced to in my dissertation only. and from the past four months i have studied it and was fascinated by it i was intrigued by it and i wanted to share this thing with everyone so that's why i created this channel called kekule connect where basic principles of different fields of bibliometric analysis different aspects of scientometrics will be discussed uh, by me and yeah thing uh, this is the second video the first video is on intellectual property rights the leading treaties on intellectual property rights check it out it's available on the channel and uh, this video is going to about bibliometric analysis data visualization and vosphere vosphere is a tool made for data visualization for so for scientific network um by using different databases such as web of science scopus dimensions right so these are the basic uh and you will also uh, got to know the limitations of scientific uses and abuses of bibliometrics right so these are the some of the things which covered in this presentation and uh, by the way i also wanted to tell you that uh, tutorial video on bosphere a detailed full a to z everything right a detailed video on bosphere will be available in few days after the publishing of this video itself and i also wanted to tell you that the time stamp of this video of this particular presentation will be available in the description box do check it out was it going to be a long i am covering all the basic tenets from basics to advanced the bibliometric and scientometric right so obviously this video is going to be long i would also suggest those of you who are interested in this new podcast uh, they can listen it as a podcast because firstly uh, it's totally in english because i am assuming and i am most probably uh most of the viewers i'm supposing that they will uh be outside india and so i have made this video in english and subtitles will be available uh i have uploaded the subtitles right so yeah this is the thing so now starting with the presentation right okay so starting with the presentation uh firstly i would start by confessing that this presentation is not a general view right it is a very or i should say highly specific in terms of certain concepts explanations definitions and collection of images especially in the sections where i would talk about data visualization and visualization tools in which i am particularly focusing on bots view which is popular for bibliometric analysis for its user friendly interface and easy interpretation this presentation is also going to be a little biased in the section of data visualization because the people which i will mention are the ones which have influenced me personally and there may be a possibility that i will left some figures of whom you people are aware of as far as this field of data visualization is concerned the databases which i have mentioned are Google Scholar, Dimensions, Web of Science, and Scopus, and the visualization tools related to scientometrics discussed are Vosphere and Sites. Right. Okay. So well, although I personally prefer Vosphere, the reason for which I have discussed in this presentation also, I have made a detailed tutorial of Vosphere and the interpretation of different maps with proper example. Do check that out. at last before going further i would request all of those who are viewing this to please mention any sort of doubt or mistake or any insightful suggestion so that i would correct it or make another video based on your comments 
It is also possible by the time you see this presentation, because I don't trust YouTube algorithm, a separate video regarding the suggestions may have been uploaded. So do check that out. It's possible that it may contain your doubts or thoughts, right? Okay, so now without any further ado, let's start with the presentation. Since the first decade of the millennium, the words, ranking, evaluation metrics, H index, and impact factors have wreaked havoc in the world of higher education and research. As we all are aware that research is a complex social activity. It is performed in a variety of environments by a wide array of actors and includes many different activities. Production of new knowledge is built upon countless hours of work in laboratories and libraries, meetings with students and collaborators, and formal and informal interactions with other scholars and the public. These activities are difficult, if not impossible, to measure directly. The measurement of research, therefore, is tasked with translating these activities into measurable units called indicators. Governments and research administrators want to evaluate everything. Teachers, professors, researchers, training programs, and universities using quantitative indicators. The rankings of the university in which some of you are studying or will study or have been already passed out are a result of these indicators. Among the tools used to measure research excellency, pride of place has been given to bibliometry, a research speciality that typically analyzes the number of scientific publications produced by a given entity, individual institution country, and the number of citations that they receive. While the number of papers provide the simple indicator of production and productivity if a time unit is defined, the number of citations that a paper receives is often considered an intuitive measure of the quality and scientific impact of the published research. Used to rank universities, right? Used to rank universities, laboratories, and researchers. Various combinations of these numbers provide indicators that are considered an objective measure of the value of research results that many argue should usefully replace the more subjective evaluations that have been in use since the 17th century. Now, coming with the these 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 points, right, highlighted in black, which uh, which basically conveys that confronted with the generalized use of quantitative indicators to evaluate their research activities, many scientists thus discovered bibliometrics in the 1990s, right, and started to criticize its use, denouncing its shortcomings and the reverse effects that these simplistic indicators may have on the dynamics of scientific research. However, and paradoxically, researchers themselves are often the first to highlight the impact factor of the journals in which they publish and to display their total number of citations or their H index. More on this to come later, as signs of their own value and success without always understanding the real meaning and validity of such indicators. Also, they often do not hesitate as members of evaluation committees to use these same measures to rank their colleagues and decide whether they should get research grants. Critics rarely question the epistemological foundations of these indicators. Do they have the meaning that is attributed to them? Do they measure what they are supposed to measure? Are they appropriate to the concepts that they are supposed to measure? Quality, productivity, impact, etc. The problems raised by the abundant, though largely dependent literature on the abuses of bibliometrics in research evaluation are often the result of the ill-defined relation between a concept and its indicators, as well as the lack of specification of the scale at which the indicators are valid and useful. And here, I would like to give you an overview of the first part of the presentation, which is going to discuss this issue along with the origin of bibliometrics, its application in science policy, research evaluation, dynamics of science, the concept of scientific networks, which is actually the focus of this presentation, 
and sort of this channel content. After I will discuss some myths related to citation practices, the evaluation of research evaluation, and the role of unit measurements and data source. Last but not the least, in the limitations of bibliometric indicators and that too with an insightful analogy. Right. Okay. Also, the structure of the presentation is inspired by these highly, highly insightful books whose main objective is to present in a successful manner the basic concepts and methods of bibliometrics in order to demonstrate that they have a much broader scope than just research evaluation, which is a relatively recent application of its methods. Given that it is impossible, not to say undesirable, to escape evaluation altogether, it is crucial to understand the specific properties of the most common bibliometric indicators and rigorously criticize the ones that are poorly constructed and whose use could cause or have already caused unintended negative consequences. This task is even more urgent when one learns that 70% of higher education writes, and I would repeat that, 70% of higher education managers of European universities admit using published university rankings to make policy decisions, even though, as we shall see, it has been shown many times that the measures used in these rankings are invalid. And that, in fact, only about 15% of international students know of the existence of these rankings. And only 10% of the latter use them to choose a university. Now, coming to the origin. Okay, so to start with the origin of this field, let us clarify the terminology of the field. The term scientometrics, generally attributed to the physicist Vasily Vasilyevich Nelimov, who used its Russian equivalent, Narcomatria, in the title of a book published in 1969, which covers the quantitative measurement of all kinds of scientific activities in all disciplines. Its data include the amount of money invested in research and development, the scientific personnel involved in R&D and the production of articles and patents. Although we tend to think of scientific articles in this field, right, in this field, publication includes other kinds of documents as well, including, at least in principle, books, PhD thesis, and research reports. Bibliometrics, term coined in 1969 by Alan Richard, is a subset of scientometrics, and it is limited to the analysis of publications and their property. When the analysis of patents is involved, the term technometrics is often used. Right? Technometrics. Also, with the advent of the internet, the term webometrics has been added to the vocabulary to cover the analysis of electronic access and use of scientific publications. Despite these formal distinctions, the term scientometrics and bibliometrics have rapidly become interchangeable. Right, as the analysis of scientific production, whether in paper or electronic form, came to occupy a central position in the study of dynamics of science. The conventional birth of bibliometrics is usually associated with the publication in the mid-1920s of a now classic study of the distribution of researchers Scientific Productivity by the American statistician Alfred Lotka. In this seminal paper, Lotka establishes the law that now bears his name, which states that the number of authors P who publish N articles is inversely proportional to the square of N. Right. However, as Benoit Gordon has shown, psychologists were in fact the first in the early 20th century to analyze the evolution of the number of publications in their field. Thus, doing bibliometrics without using that before. But contrary to Lotka's works, his analyses were not intended to find general laws. Rather, they aimed only to track the growth of their own speciality. Right? And this is important to know. 
despite these early examples, bibliometric studies only started to become more systematic with the development during the 1920s and 1930s. The management of library journal collections. As academic journals increased in number and cost, librarians have sought objective method to select the ones that were the most useful to researchers. In this context of journal collection management, citation analysis really took off. Instead of just counting publications, right, and I would like to repeat this thing, that instead of just counting publication, librarians started looking at the references, right, the references, that is citations, that they contained to measure how useful papers and journals were in fact to scientists. By analyzing which journals were the most cited in a given discipline and over what period of time. Chemistry being the most studied area at first, librarians would separate those that were still useful from the ones that could be considered absolute because they were rarely cited and thus move them to make space for recent issue. Many years before the American linguist Eugene Garfield promoted the idea of citation index in the mid 1950s, scientists already understood intuitively the citations contained in scientific papers provide useful information on the research practices of scientists and the social dynamics of science. But it was due to analysis of the content of the main US chemistry journals for the year 1926, the authors who chemists found that although more than 247 different journals were cited, a majority, more than 130, got fewer than three citations. The fact that German journals are much cited, the suggestion that students should thus learn German, and the observation of the lack of citation for many years to a journal that cost the library precious money that could be better invested, our findings would have been uh, basically these findings, right? That uh, the journal that cost the library precious money that could be better invested, right? These findings would have been hard to reach means other than citation analysis and that's why citation analysis is so important right the growth of bibliometric analysis of different disciplines and specialities naturally led to the creation of concepts that were specific to this new research domain formalize the idea that a typical article has become less and less used and cited over time the concept of a half-life of scientific literature, analogous with the radioactive decay of elements, was defined in the early 1960s. By analogy, one can define a kind of half-life by counting the number of years it takes to cover 50% of the total number of references. The simple indicator provides a measure of the useful life of scientific literature in a given field. For example, early studies showed that in mathematics, Half of the cited publication are less than 10 years old, whereas in physics, the half-life is shorter, at 5 years. This finding reveals that the fact that mathematic items typically have, on average, a longer life than physics items. Similarly, but with a forward-looking orientation, one can define the half-life of citations as the time it takes to accumulate half of the total number of citations received. After World War II, the exponential growth in the number of articles published made it impossible for researchers to track the results of new research, even when limited to their own specialized area. In this context, Eugene Garfield proposed in 1955 a plan to index all articles cited in the scientific literature. The model was based on shepherd citations. Right after World War II, due to the obviously exponential growth in number of articles, Eugene Garfield in 1955 planned to index all the articles cited in the scientific literature, and the model was based on Shepherd citations. An index that listed all citations to legal decisions in the United States, making it easier to tell whether a given judgment was often referred to and possibly creating jurisprudence as well. Garfield published in the journal Science details of his own project 
an electronic database of citations to the scientific literature. The objective was to facilitate bibliographic research by using cited articles to help identify papers dealing with the same subject. The basic underlying intuition was that a citation to a given paper would suggest a conceptual link between the citing and the cited items. Finding new articles citing a particular paper of interest quickly build a relevant bibliography, but it's quite plausible in that an article that cites, for instance, Albert Einstein's 1905 paper on relativity theory is indeed concerned with that topic and not with chemistry, obviously. Convinced of the usefulness and profitability of the project, Arfield founded the Institute for Scientific Information, ISI, in Philadelphia in 1959. In 1969, he received funds from the National Science Foundation, NSF, and National Institute of Health, NIH, to study the feasibility of an automated citation index. Once the prototype was developed, the ISI released the Science Citation Index Sci for 1963 and continued to expand its coverage over the years. Even today, the Web of Science and its recent competitor Elsevier Scopus Data provide unique tools that you construct a bibliography quickly on a given subject, which I am also going to discuss in the Vosphere tutorial video. So do check that out. And by the way, the VOSWARE tools utilizes this for data visualization also, which as I told, we'll discuss further in this presentation, only in the overview and later in the in detail video. Please note that researchers keep calling them indexes because from the 1960 to 1980s, the product was in fact a book that listed in alphabetical order the names of cited Right. Okay. Now coming to the bibliometrics for science policy, Derek de Sola Price, an English historian of science, gave Scientometric its first theoretical basis. A physicist by training, he proposed to analyze science as a collective phenomenon analogous with the statistical physics of a gas following the evolution of all scientists and their publications rather than merely focusing on a single scientist, such as Albert Einstein. Price wanted to create what he called a science of science, right? Science of science based on the quantitative analysis of scientific development. Price was also the first to use the new uh, sci for sociological rather than bibliographic analysis. Despite the work of librarians of citation analysis and the promotion of a science of science by Price, research in bibliometrics long remained confined to a small community composed of scientists, librarians, sociologists, and historians who examine each for their own reasons the properties of scientific publications and of the references they contain, that is the citation. The real development of bibliometric as an academic research field occurred only in the 1970s with the coming of age of science policy. This is because the second half of 1960 marked a turning point in the organization of science, as many countries showed a renewed interest in science policy and planning. Reflection on the ways to stimulate the development of research required indicators of research and innovation, much as economic and social development indicators were designed in the wake of the economic crisis of the 1930s and World War. Government demand for indicators capable of measuring the level of scientific and technological development and thereby provide the necessary information to design national science and technological policies stimulated the development of a previously dispersed research domain and led to the creation in 1971 of the journal Research Policy, right? Followed two years later by Science and Public Policy. These journals were especially devoted to the analysis of the social and economic factors affecting the development of science and technology in different countries. In 1974, a conference was convened where the pioneers of bibliometric reflected on the theme toward a metric of science, advent of science indicators. The historical, sociological and economic aspects of the measurement of science were analyzed by various experts with the aim of producing a coherent model for the development of science indicators. Gerard Halton, a physics professor and historian of science at the conference, wondered aloud if science would really be measured. The other sociologists, the brothers Stephen and Jonathan Kuhl, discussed the cognitive aspects of scientific discipline. 
for their part garfield and his colleagues showed that quantitative methods such as bibliographic coupling and co-citation analysis of documents could be used as a tool for mapping the conceptual structure of scientific disciplines and speciality as well as their temporal development the first journal devoted entirely to this topic scientometrics was created in 1978 the very existence of the computerized database of the sci also encouraged research projects projects using bibliometric data now coming to the bibliometric of research evaluation having been used mainly in the management of library collections of germans right in the management of library collection of journals and as a source of data for academic research on the development of science bibliometric tools began to be used for evaluating the productivity and scientific impact of research activities in the 1980s data based management methods first applied in the private sector and based on the ideas of bench marking and knowledge management were transferred to the public sector in the 1980s and to universities in the 1990s until the start of the 21st century most of bibliometric analysis was done at the level of countries universities or laboratories not to assess individual despite warnings by many scientometricians the practice of using bibliometric indicators to evaluate individual scientists and developed among managers and researchers improvising as experts in evaluation this uncritical and undisciplined and often unvalid use of bibliometric analysis and indicators has been facilitated by the fact that bibliographic databases now can be accessed easily through universities libraries web and through databases online databases such as scopus and the web of science and the internet that is google scholar web which is free today scientists can play with publication and citation numbers without much regard for the meaning of the data right and uh, as a term coined by is ingrass wild bibliometrics which gives rise to inadequate and invalid indicators like the h index now to summarize what we have discussed till now right i am going to tell you about the summary in the 1920s until the late 1950s bibliometrics relied on manual methods was limited to small samples and was used primarily to help manage journal collections in libraries the computerized databases of the sci opened the way in the early 1960s to large scale analysis of the dynamics of scientific change this innovation also came at a time when science policy was emerging and needed new indicators to measure the global level of scientific development of countries during the 1970s and 1980s the situation fostered the study of the indicators by combining in a more or less fanciful manner bibliometric data on papers and citations even forging equations to identify the best researchers these abuses of evaluative bibliometrics have discredited the set of methods that are nonetheless essential for those who want to understand the global dynamics of science interestingly whereas paper produced by experts in bibliometrics tend to appear in specialized journals those produced by scientists since the 1990s tend to be published in their own disciplinary journals and often consist in listings of the most cited authors or journals in their fields in peer reviewed by colleagues who are not themselves knowledgeable in bibliometrics they are published even when the work ignores the existing specialized literature on science it must also be said finally that too many publications in bibliometrics do not take into account the sociological aspects of the dynamics of science thus talking about citations and tweets and blogs as if they were on the same level and responded to the same sociological dynamic Now coming to the dynamics of science according to bibliometrics 
rapid expansion of diplomatic analysis depends on having access to an electronic database that made data analysis on a large scale possible. For about 40 years, starting in the 1963, the only source of bibliometric data was Eugene Garfield's Science Citation Index. Produced by his company, the Institute of Scientific Information, which was later acquired by Thomson Reuters, resulting in the formation of Web of Science and now acquired by Clarivative Analytics. We had to wait until 2004 for a competing database, Opus, produced by Elsevier. This long monopoly explains why all the publications in the field of scientometrics were until recently based on the ISI databases. Studies based on the Scopus database, however, have multiplied in recent years. A third source of bibliometric information, Google Scholar, also appeared on the scene during the 2000s, but it does not have the same neat structure as the other two, which provide organized information on addresses and countries of authors, as well as the list of references, citations, and their papers. A classification into subfields and other resources, thus facilitating the analysis of publication and citation at the level of institution and countries. Bibliometric databases do not contain the full text of articles, but rather a set of metadata. Right, a set of metadata associated with each paper. Typically recorded are the title of the article, the journal in which it was published, the names of all authors an institutional affiliation, the type of document, article, letter, editorial, book review, etc. and the complete list of references contained there. It is the list of re references that gives the web of science and now scopus its specificity compared to other kinds of bibliographic sources. And since these references sometimes include patents, this feature made possible the analysis of patent citations. Conversely, patent databases which also contain references to scientific papers would also be used starting in the 1980s to establish links between scientific research and technological innovation. Once computerized, all this information is recognized to form a database, queries combining different fields, authors, countries, institutions, journals, etc. can thus be formulated to get results in different scales of analysis. What would have taken months of works using the Paper copies of Sci in the 1970s can now be done in hours, if not minutes. In fact, that contributes to the inflation of the number of paper using bibliometric data in all disciplines. In its paper format, the Sci identified only the first author of a cited paper, even though most items were usually written by more than one researcher. This choice was made to simplify data acquisition and limit costs at a time when computers were big and slow. This pragmatic choice limited the possibilities of analysis, for it would have taken a lot of time to find. For example, citations to authors, who as the head of the laboratory usually came last in the list. As early users of sci sociologists of sciences suggested that databases include all the names, or at least that of last author, for the reason just mentioned. Garfield, aware of the cost involved in such change, responded by recalling that the sci was not created as a tool for measuring the performance of scientists. And now this statement is actually contradicted nowadays. It was and remains primarily a tool for information retrieval, according to Garfield. As such, the first order, year, journal, volume, and page are more than sufficient as an identifier with improvements in computer technology and with the rising demand from research evaluation, bibliometric databases now include a complete list of cited authors, thus making their use possible and also easier for evaluation purposes. It is also important to note that since the productivity of researchers has not grown significantly, the average number of citations per article has accordingly increased over time. It follows that the absolute number of citations means little in itself or in comparison with other disciplines and always should be interpreted in relation to the practices of the discipline of the researcher at a given. Not surprisingly, biomedical sciences have the most cited articles and humanities the least cited. Not because of their different scientific impact, but mainly as a consequence of the different citing cultures of these fields. Now coming to the scientific networks, 
far from being limited to the simple counting of publications, bibliometrics have built on more sophisticated tools like network analysis to represent patterns of scientific collaboration and relations between disciplines. One can thus literally map relations among countries or institutions. At the cognitive level, one can also map the relation among research domains. These measures take advantage of the fact that articles contain the address of all authors, thus defining a link between countries when at least two authors work in different countries. Combining countries and disciplines, one can analyze differences in pattern of collaborations between countries according to disciplines. For instance, such relation can be high in physics and low in genetics, thus defining strategic relations between countries. On a lower scale, one could also map links between different institutions in the same country to obtain a representation of inter-institutional collaborations. Right. Bibliometrics can shed light on dynamic relations between disciplines and measure their relative openness to outside influences. Although disciplinary boundaries are never impermeable, scientists tend to refer first to their own discipline. That's human nature. A simple way to measure such interchange between fields is to look at the intercitation network between citing and cited journal. Dynamic bibliometric monitoring of science also shines a light on the emergence of new fields of research, such as nanotechnology and biotechnology. Using keywords contained in the articles taken from the full text abstract or the title, researchers and firms specializing in scientific and technological intelligence can thus be aware of recent research and discoveries in their fields of interest. Finally, Citation analysis can be used to illuminate the conceptual links between articles. If two articles share a large proportion of their references, then it is likely that they deal with the same topic. It is this intuition that lies behind the method for bibliographic coupling that by Michael Kessler in the early 1960s find related documents automatically. A decade later, Henry Small devised a method called co-citation analysis, which links two documents that are often cited together in scientific papers. The two approaches are complementary and allow the construction of conceptual networks showing the connection between fields and subjects, making visible relatively distinct subjects. One can then use community detection techniques to automatically identify relatively autonomous disciplines in the entire field of science and distinct specialities within discipline. Over the past 10 years, much work has been devoted to the display of relations between disciplines. Most of these representations show the hierarchy of sciences is not linear, as had been suggested by philosophers from Francis Bacon to Auguste Comte, but rather circular. The Swiss psychologist and epistemologist Jean Piaget was one of the first to suggest. Also, in the section discussing data visualization, I have shown taking reference from the Manuel Lima's Book of Circles how circular hierarchy of the sciences exist inherently in the systems. Bibliometric analysis can be put to good and sophisticated use to understand aspects of the historical and sociological dynamics of science, which would otherwise be difficult to access. These kinds of analysis go far beyond anecdotes, disciplinary bias and arguments from authority which are still too often used but cannot constitute a serious basis for decision-making in science and technology policy. As recently pointed out in a report from the Council of Canadian Academics, bibliometric data can serve to inform and enlighten choices, but they cannot replace human decision-making processes. Whatever the numbers may be for a given indicator, they cannot lead to any individual policy decision by themselves. Now, coming to myths on citation practices, there are many myths and cliches about citation practices that circulate among scientists which do not survive a serious bibliometric analysis of the data. For example, and uh, well, to consider this example at, as it is very important, uh, it is very important common to hear that only papers that are less than four or five years old are read and cited. And thus the rapid growth in the number of publications increase the tendency to refer only to the most recent results. 
but a comprehensive study of the temporal evolution of the average or median age of references contained in scientific papers shows that the average and median age have actually increased over the last 30 years. Similarly, the idea that most articles are never cited is false. The proportion of non-cited articles actually has been decreasing over time, especially since the 1970s, measuring the proportion of uncited articles obviously depends on the time frame used for citing a given item. If it is limited to a two-year window, as it is usually the case, it is clear that the proportion of non-cited items will be larger in the social sciences than in the natural and biomedical sciences for reasons related to the time it takes to publish articles in these different fields. However, if one increases this observation window to 5 or 10 years, for example, the proportion of unsighted atoms in social sciences decreases and becomes comparable to that of natural sciences. These data remind us that the temporality of scientific research greatly varies between disciplines. Those who oppose citation analysis often invoke the so-called fact that erroneous or even fraudulent results may be highly cited in that, conversely, truly innovative work may stay uncited for a while. However, from the standpoint of the history and sociology of science, this is not a problem. On the contrary, the study of these citations illuminates the dynamics of scientific controversies and knowledge dissemination. It allows us to characterize the reception of a story without having to judge whether it is good or not. Indeed, this question can be decided only by scientific community itself. Take the case of cold fusion. Announced with great fanfare in 1989 by the electrochemists Stanley Pons and Martin Fishman, a bibliometric study published in the following year showed that just 10 months after the announcement of their revolutionary discovery, that nuclear fission was possible at room temperature in a test tube, 52% of the citations were negative, 27% positive, and the rest were neutral. Interestingly, the positive citation came from theorists who attempted to explain the phenomenon. As for the negatives, its proportion is much higher than the 15% suggested by a sample of 30 papers published in Physical Review between 1968 and 1972. The absence of citation to a given article does not necessarily show its low quality, but simply that scientists are not yet interested in the topic being treated. Who pay attention to this beautiful, beautiful which is, the scientists can discover an interest in such a topic much later and begin to cite an old article. In bibliometric, this phenomena is known as sleeping beauty. For example, a physics paper by the Italian physicist Ettor Majorana on the relativistic theory of particles with arbitrary spin, published in 1937, slept until the mid-1960s, when a number of new particles with different spin were found in accelerators, thus giving Majorana's theory a timelineness it did not have in the 1920s, when only protons and electrons of one half spin were known. Note, however, that Majorana was not unknown at the time, as his other important contributions were highly cited. Another cliché that circulates among scientists affirms that major discoveries like those of Einstein or the structure of the DNA awaited many years to be cited. Thus, in a paper often cited by critics of bibliometrics, the British biologist Peter Lawrence wrote that the most important article of the 20th century was really mentioned during the first 10 years following its publication. As the article in question was that of James Watson and Francis Crick on the structure of DNA, published in Nature in 1953, came by Lawrence is intriguing since the two researchers won the Nobel Prize in 1960. Only 10 years after their discovery, a time that seemed short compared to the usually much longer time lag between discovery and price. In this context, it seemed unlikely that the paper was ignored. A detailed analysis of the citations to this article between 1953 and 1970 showed that Lawrence's statement was a myth due to a misuse of bibliometry. A famous British biologist, right? And how, uh, 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 because we all are humans, right? 
and we all can commit mistakes so you can see it is also cautionary tale actually this this example right and uh, based on interpreting the absolute number of citation without taking into account the context and the type of journal citing that foundational paper and then with the rigor needed including appropriate calibrations it was founded that far from making known watson and crick paper actually was the most cited of all paper published in nature in 1963 right? uh, sorry 1953 and remained so until 1970 between 1953 and 1955 for example it was cited 36 times more than the average number of citations seen by all nature papers published in 1953 and between 1956 and 1958 this proportion rose to 65 times more than the average if one notes that the average number of citation to nature paper is already much higher than that of all the journals of biology it is clear that the watson and crick paper was highly visible from the very beginning in short from a sociological perspective such basic items do not really go unnoticed within the relevant scientific community and this fact is adequately reflected in the citation data as these examples show it is possible to study from historical and sociological points of view publications and citations of a single researcher or a single paper without falling into the traps of evaluation and rankings now coming to the evaluation of research evaluation i would like to start this section by raising a question which criteria can tell us that a given indicator is valid well and really measures what it is supposed to measure what is most remarkable about the multiplication of indicator is that they are never explicitly submitted to any criteria to test their validity before they are used to evaluate researchers or universities quoting a para by wes gingras in his book bibliometric and research evaluation right although it may seem surprising it was frequently necessary to remind my clients that we cannot assess anything if we do not first identify the mission and objectives of the organization in question and i hope that all The, the 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 heads the organization would behave in the same way the author has worked with many organizations right and his experiences seen in this and his ethics also in the statement uh, and uh, working with many organization to conduct bibliometric evaluations of research institution and uh, and from the experiences accumulated over the years he mentions two important point right uh these points are one cannot evaluate a government laboratory and a university research center in the same way for they have different missions and thus need different measures of their activities and the evaluation must be undertaken in relation to previously determined objectives adding to this it is also imperative that these objectives be specific enough because one must start from those objectives to define indicators that can measure whether these goals were achieved or not if the first mission of a government laboratory is to ensure the protection of citizens by carrying out various more or less routine measures of quality and security it should be obvious that the number of publications or citations in scholarly journals is not the most important indicator of success conversely a university research laboratory that gets plenty of industry contract but publishes little in scientific journal would be considered problematic given that the usual core mission of a university which is to increase knowledge make it publicly accessible and train students in all disciplines and professions in other words one should not first select indicators and then adapt the mission to them rather one should first establish the mission and goals and then try to find adequate indicators to measure the expected kinds of results achieved through the activities of the members of the organization now coming to the unit of measurements and data sources section in the field of higher education and research despite repeated calls to multiply indicators basic units that can enter into any possible indicator remain relatively limited on the input side 
there are people, researchers, postdoctoral scientists, students, instruments and money that generate activity. On the output side, one can tally the different products of these activities. Publications, articles, books, reports, patents, conferences, and of course trained graduate students, MAs and PhDs. Finally, looking at the use and effects of the different outputs, one can assess the outcomes and impact of these activities. For graduates, measuring their rate of employment and level of satisfaction makes sense. But using salary data is more of an issue since traders are usually better paid than scientists. But that in itself does not make them better. To measure the huge visibility impact or quality of papers, one can count the citation that they get in other papers or even in patents. In the internet age, we can use new measures of visibility, such as the number of times the digital version of the articles have been accessed or downloaded. Going further beyond the limit of the scientific field, one can also measure the visibility of papers in the public space by looking at the many internet discussion platforms like Twitter and blogs. And given that citation have long been only unit that could be used to measure scientific impact, it is surprising that they have remained the focus of attention. The many criticisms of citation analysis, coupled with the research evaluation fever, evaluation fever, right, and transformation of the publication landscape from paper to internet, have converged to give rise to a movement promoting alternative measures of impact, which produced the Alt Matrix Manifesto in 2010. The promoters of the movement insist that it takes years to get cited. Right. They thus implicitly ex accept the curious idea that we must know immediately what has had an impact or not. And that the most likely way to know this is to look at immediate internet visibility on the new and rapidly multiplying discussion platform. Beyond the fact that the supposed alternative metrics measure little more than a visibility, that include citizens and outsiders to the scientific field. The most obvious effect of this discourse is to create a niche market compete with the one monopolized by Elsevier and Thomson Reuters. It is one thing to identify indicators for an assessment. It is quite another to ensure that the data to construct them are available, reliable and accessible at an affordable price. Three major Sources can now be used to measure the output and impact of scientific publications, which has been discussed earlier, that is Web of Science, Scopus, and Google Scholar. While access to the first two databases is restricted to subscribers, Google Scholar is free. From the point of view of rigorous and transparent research evaluation, the major advantage of the first two, that is Scopus and Web of Science sources, is that their content is controlled and well-defined, as one can know the list of journals included at any given time. The downside, of course, is that they are not free. In fact, they can even be quite expensive. While Google Scholar is free and thus easily accessible to anyone. The problem is that its content is not well defined and varies constantly. That we have no idea of its real content. Being based on the total content of the internet, it includes peer-reviewed articles, but it also offers any other document that one put but that one can put on a personal website. Items can appear and disappear as well. So one has no control over the validity of indicators calculated from this source. This is problematic from an ethical point of view as evaluation should be transparent when they can affect people's careers. In addition, this database does not contain the institutional addresses of authors, which further limits its use for evaluation purposes. Not only that, but Google Scholar is vulnerable to manipulation also. And this vulnerability also exists in the data visualization tools, which I am going to show in the tutorial video of Wasp. Now, let's take an example. Cyril Lebe, a French computer scientist at Grenoble Joseph Fourier University, showed how to manipulate the contents of Google Scholar to increase the edge index of a fictional research whom he named I can't kill. Right? Now, do notice here one thing. I-K-E-A-N-T-K-R-E. How is it pronounced? 
I can't hear. I cannot. So it was a disguise and very interesting. He created short hundred articles, right? The, 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 the French computer scientist, uh, right? And citing each other and place them on a website. They were then harvested by Google Scholar, which generated an H index of 94. H index of 94, right? A figure very difficult to achieve by most actual scientists. Some have used this case to point out the limits of bibliometrics. In fact, however, it says nothing about bibliometric per se, but rather about Google Scholar, which is not a reliable database for doing rigorous and ethically transparent bibliometric evaluation of an individual scientist. But this example leads us to the limits of scientometrics, which I am going to present with the mentioning of a highly insightful book named Science Fictions by Stuart Ritchie. Right. So, in one of the interviews conducted during the promotion of the book, a question was asked to the author that the grand and scary claim of your book is that something is rotten in the kingdom of science. To which Richie replied, Absolutely. You think of science as being this objective thing that tells us facts about the world and produces all these scientific papers, which are almost sacred things. But Lot of people don't see how the sausage is made. I think if they had more of an idea of how the processes happens, they would question the truth status of those papers much more. In a lot of cases, the science is useless, not worth the paper it is written on. Fraud, bias, negligence and hype are the themes of science fiction. His examples of quotient findings run from psychic recognition, psychological priming, and the benefits of striking a power pose to track your transplant, the blood microbe, and autism like characteristic in mice, arsenic based like that. All the replication failure and scientific misconduct stories you have heard are here, along with the more that you haven't. Together, these crank up the tension between engaged scientific criticism and maintaining trust in science. In many ways, book is a defense of ideals that he thinks we have drifted away from. Central to those are the norms of science codified in 1942 by sociologist Robert Merton, right? Giving universalism, disinterestedness, communality, and organized skepticism. Yet, Ritchie fails to acknowledge that even in what we might consider predict matic breakthroughs, scientists have mostly not followed such norms. This uncritical presentation might unsettle those interested in modern philosophy. Started by Thomas Kuhn by writing his famous book, The Scientific, The, 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 the Structure of Revolution of Scientific Revolution, Structure of Scientific Revolution, The Structure of Scientific Revolution by Thomas Kuhn, in which he coined the word called paradigm shift. So that that's an interesting recommendation. Okay. Now recalling the case study of the French computer scientist creating a fictional researcher. This would not have been possible in the web of science or Scopus database, since the journals they cover publish peer-reviewed articles, not documents that simply happen to be on the internet somewhere. And the fact that at the aggregate level. For large groups of institutions, there is a correlation between the results of various databases. It does not validate the use of Google Scholar since for individual evaluations, the quality of the database and the sources that it contains is crucial to the credibility of the evaluation process and the correct interpretation of the indicator. These new market conditions have also increased the competition between Thomas Reuters and Elsevier and directly influenced the very content of their database. Now, please pay attention. Until 2004, when Scopus hit the market, the Science Citation Index, SEISI, was unique and dedicated to the idea of covering only the best journals of all disciplines, which were basically defined as the most cited journals. Confronted with the competition of Scopus, which highlighted the fact that it covers many more journals and attractive feature for libraries, 
the VOS has increased the number of journals that it indexes. The coverage on not just the so-called quality of the included journals thus become a selling point and a good reason for libraries to subscribe. Opus, as of 2015, lists about 22,000 journals and Web of Science, 12,000. If one includes conference proceedings and other sources, Opus's tally rises to about 29,000 sources and Web of Science to 18,000. Two databases have more than 50% of their journals in common, but Scopus has a large number of unique journals. Now, coming to the limitations of bibliometric indicators, which is, by the way, very concerning and intriguing at the same time. So, firstly, the proportion of international collaborations cannot be used as a valid indicator of internationalization when the prevailing contributions are single author articles, as is still the case in disciplines such as history and philosophy. Similarly, one cannot expect the same level of international collaboration in research on the northern agriculture of France as in the study of the distribution of black holes in the universe. These simple examples highlight the importance of understanding the nature of the data used as well as the specificity of the disciplines and research topics to be assessed in order to ensure that a chosen indicator is appropriate and valid. It should also be remembered that the extent of coverage of disciplines, specialities and countries varies according to the database used. Another obvious limitation of the use of bibliometrics in research evaluation is the fact that these databases do not cover all the journals in which research is published. Unrecorded works, especially those in languages other than English, are thus under value. Right. So, again, see variability in databases. Databases do not cover all journals and under value of unrecorded works. Although it has not been demonstrated that these papers are of lesser quality than those published in journals covered in databases like Scopus and WebOps. Coming to the fifth point, books are not indexed in the Web of Science or Scopus. It is often correctly noted that books are not in this in the in, in these platforms, but that statement is often confused with the incorrect one. Please, please, please listen to this carefully. Right? That statement is often confused. Right? The statement that books are not indexed in the web of science or scopus, it is often confused with the incorrect one. That citations to books are not included. Citation to books are included, right, in these databases. Now, it is obvious that the Web of Science and Scopus do include all the books cited in the journal articles that they cover, and given that social sciences and humanities journals cite books more often than articles, it is unlikely that adding books to the databases will significantly change the distribution of citation in these disciplines. Adding Water, citations in books, if I had to draw an analogy, right? So adding water, citation in books, to such a pool of citation in journals will raise the average level of water, that is, total number of citations, but most likely will not change its overall composition. For example, country rankings of the overall production of paper are roughly the same in Scopus and Boss databases. Despite the fact that they cover different journals, although significant variations may appear at lower scales of aggregation, like disciplines. Also an insightful observation that it would be very surprising that a person who is little cited in journals would become widely cited in books in the same discipline, especially since books now tend to contain revised version of already published papers. For these reasons, it is probably useless for evaluation purposes to invest in creating a separate book citation index, as Thomson Reuters recently did. For it is not the absolute number of citation that is important, but the relative distribution and proportion of citation received in a given book. Coming to the sixth limitation, excluding most local journals. Right, bibliometric evaluation is basically a form of sampling, although it is obviously a skewed and not random form as it excludes most local journals. English language bias of the major databases, and this is actually an important. Country analysis right, is also very much influenced by the strong English language bias of the major databases, particularly 
in social sciences and humanities, a factor that makes their use in these fields very problematic. At last, I will also share some personal point of view related to the rise of the alt matrix. Uh, whatever the future of the myriad alt matrix that are now proposed on the evaluation market, their indicator should obey the same criteria as any classical indicator measuring a concept. At this time, we know that none of these supposedly alternative measures of impact have a definite meaning and that none can seriously serve as a basis for decision making in higher education and research. It is quite obvious that citations to a scientific paper takes years to build, whereas the number of tweets will peak after only a few days. There is no doubt, however, that the former provides a better measure of scientific impact than the latter. And we have already given much power to Twitter and its CEO. From a sociological point of view, Twitter is basically at a one con conversation on a global scene. It gives access to superficial discourse that until now has been confined, fortunately, within their walls. To anyone seriously concerned with measuring the effects of scientific research, it is worth recalling that the half-life of citation is measured in years, whereas the half-life of blogs of the order of days, that of tweets, is measured in mere minutes. What is the meaning of impact of indicated and leave no trace after a few days or on the basis of these different time scales? It would be obvious that counting tweets cannot serve as a valid indicator of scientific impact. Although studying the dynamic of exchanges on Twitter, Certainly can tell us interesting things about what kind of science excites citizens active on that media and what does not. That can be a point which can uh, many people can thought about, but not the form of it, right? So now coming to the analogy, Emperor's New Clothes. The many debates surrounding the question of the validity of various rankings of universities as well as indicator of research impacts that now circulate throughout the academic world, imply demonstrate that these uses are determined by political and strategic reasons. Nonetheless, it remains somewhat mysterious that many otherwise intelligent and well-educated academics and administrators continue using invalid indicators, often called metrics, to promote their institutions and make important strategic decisions on hiring and promotions. In this concluding section of the first part of the presentation, I will draw an analogy of the ranking system to the 19th century Danish author Hans Christian Andersen classic tale, The Emperor's New Clothes. One may seriously wonder if by naivety or cynicism, many academic leaders and managers who take seriously these rankings are not in a position of similar to that of poor emperor was so excessively fond of new clothes that he had been persuaded by two rogues calling themselves weavers that they knew how to weave stuffs of the most beautiful colors and elaborate patterns the new clothes have the wonderful property of remaining invisible to everyone who was unfit for the office he had or was extraordinarily simple in character Although skeptical, for he could not see the supposed new cloth, but appearing, right, but afraid of appearing stupid, the emperor's old minister, who was asked to evaluate and monitor the work of the weavers, told them he would tell the emperor without delay how very beautiful he found the, in fact, invisible patterns and colors of, this new, of his new suit. Much the same as institution by rankings that they know to be highly problematic but are forcefully promoted by convincing self. Seeing nothing either but also afraid of losing his good profitable office, another employee raised the stuff he could not see and declared that he was delighted with both colors and pattern. He confirmed to the emperor that the clothes that is, the ranking which the weavers are preparing is extraordinarily magnificent. The emperor thought he would show himself to be a fool and not fit for his position if he said aloud that he thought that was nothing to see. He thus preferred to say aloud, Oh, cloth, as the ranking is charming, 
it has my complete approbation and he agreed to wear it for the next visit or marketing campaign during his public wandering all the people standing by and those at the windows cried out oh how beautiful are our emperor new clothes and these are we we the people in short no one would allow that he could not see these much admired clothes because in doing so he would have declared himself either a simpleton or unfit for his office but then there emerged the voice of innocence little child in the crowd and we can take them as a whistle blower by the way i listened this news that john mcafee has died by suicide which is not believable which is not and yeah this happens to the whistle blowers who told these emperors that hey you are naked man what we can do well the voice of innocence that of a little child in a crowd cried but he had nothing at all on the crowd finally repeated that obvious truth and the emperor was vexed for he knew that the people were right but he thought the procession must go on now and the lords of the bed chamber took greater pains than ever to appear holding up a train although in reality there was no train to hold the question is whether university leaders while will behave like the emperor and continue to wear each year the new clothes provided for them by sellers of university rankings the scientific value of which most of them admit to be non existent or if they will listen to the voice of reason and have the courage to explain to the few who still think they mean something that they are wrong reminding them in passing that the first value in a university is truth and rigor not cynicism and marketing now coming to the last part of this section in spite of the limitation of scientometric study it is observed to be one of the best ways in getting knowledge productivity of individual authors scientists institutions and journals and to study the pattern of growth of literature and nature of research public age of literature use information needs of scientists and we have to be optimistic about this right there are some cons but there are many pros and they are helping us to go on so yeah now coming to the next part next section of this presentation that is data visualization and its interpretation since the dawn of recorded history humanity has been turning to the visual realm as a sense making tool for the world and our place in it mapping and visualizing everything from the body to the brain to the universe to information itself and according to me the best representation of the data visualization and its interpretation is the pale blue dot an image clicked on the request of carl sagan by the voyage of one before leaving the solar another great metaphor for better understanding the diverse nature of data visualization the painting by the japanese artist known as the great wave of kanaga using the persian blue the highest mountain in japan and important symbol of national identity mount fuji is the prime target of the great wave furthermore and central to the analogy conveyed here the great wave is a part of an extended series of woodblock prints entitled 36 views of mount fuji odd collection of print aims at depicting mount fuji from every possible angle or viewpoint and during different seasons and times of the day it is an awe inspiring widely comprehensive analysis of mount fuji showing the imposing mountain as it is seen from the sea the plain the forest the field the village lake river beach and an excellent analogy with data visualization coming to another example in her early 40s 
a woman named Emma Heard Willard, who was America's first female cartographer and information visual visualization designer, made visionary maps of time space. Right? She set about composing and publishing a series of history textbooks that raised the standards and sensibilities of scholarship. In 1828, having just turned 40, she authored that would become the country's most widely and read history textbook, History of the United States, or Republic of America. Right. In a diagram originally created in 1845 and later printed as the front piece in an abridged edition of the textbook, she draws on the long tradition of tree diagram to depict America's history as an organic development rooted in the earth itself. What made Willard textbook so successful was her understanding. Right. It was her understanding that we are not mere intellects who compress and compute facts and figures but embodied creatures who earn to locate themselves in space and time in order to make sense of the flow of it. Just see the beauty and the detailing of this. Right. Just see the detailing. Gilbert Spit in 1578, Pilgrim's Landing. Right. So, women created this print. Right, as the cover of her textbook. It is so fascinating. Now, coming to the celebrity, right, the celebrity of the world. We all have an image of Nightingale, Florence Nightingale, who died 100 years ago today as a nurse, lady with a lamb, medical reformer, and campaigner for soldiers' health. But she was also a data journalist. Many of uh, the people don't know this fact. In the disasters of the Crimean War, Florence Nightingale returned to become a passionate campaigner for improvement in the health of the British Army. She developed the visual presentation of information, including the pie chart. Right, first developed by William Playfair in 1801, Nightingale also used statistical graphics and reports to Parliament, realizing this was the most effective way of bringing data to life. Now coming to the modern age of data business which is popularized by Manuel Lima, founder of Data Visualization Portal, Visual Complexity, an ambitious portal for the visualization of complex networks across a multitude of disciplines, from biology to history to the social web, an author of the Information Visualization Bible of the same name, with two more books, namely Book of Trees and Book of Sin. One of the most intelligent people on the planet, he also has an insightful TED Talk on the power of networks. Using examples that span from the Jewish decimal system to Wikipedia, Manuel explores the evolving organization of knowledge and information and the shift from hierarchical structures to distributed lateral networks. As you can see, the illustration taken from the book, from the Bible to Wikipedia edits to the human genome, obvious and thought-provoking visualization will make you look at the world in a whole new way. And the insightful essays accompanying them will vastly expand your understanding of the trends and technologies shaping our ever evolving relationship with information. Take, for example, visualizing the Bible 2007. Right. A map of the 3779 cross references found in the Bible, paragraph on the bottom represents all the books in the Bible, alternating between white and light gray for easy difference. The length of each bar represents the book's chapter and dropping below the date correspond to the number of verses in that chapter. Each are represents a textual cross-reference example, place, person. And the color denotes the distance between the two chapters where the References appears, ultimately creating a rainbow-like effect. Coming to his recent books on data visualization, which uses trees and circles as metaphor. Though the use of tree as a metaphor for understanding the relationship between organisms is often attributed to Darwin, who articulated it in his Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection, titled Tree of Life, right? 
1959. The concept most recently appropriated in mapping systems and knowledge networks is actually much older, predating the theory of evolution itself. The collection is thus at once a visual record of the evolution. The earliest examples dating as far back as the 16th century portray the mythic order in which God created Earth. The diagram's development over the centuries is much a progression of science and it is of culture, society and paradigm. Even our language reflects that relationship. It's an idea that has taken root in nearly every branch of knowledge. Right? Our language reflects this relation. I would repeat, an idea that has taken root in nearly every branch of knowledge. Among the legions of artists activated by trees was the great Leonardo da Vinci. Right, whose image you can see on the left side. Shortly before his death, in one of his voluminous notebooks, Da Vinci worked out a mathematical formula for the relationship between the size of tree trunk and its branches. I sometimes think what kind of human being he was. In each and every field he has dipped in. Fascinating man. Well, going on. He found that as a tree grows, the total cross-sectional area of all new branches is roughly equal to the area of the mother trunk or branch, no matter the height of the tree. Centuries later, scientific tests using computer-generated models of trees have not only found Leonardo's formula to hold up across nearly every tree species, but also to explain trees' remarkable resilience to wind and other external forces. Stephanie Pozovic's brilliant writing, writing without words, project, and drawn visualization of the literary organism in Jan Kurok's novel on the road, which you can see on the right, depicting the sentences, words, and rhythm structures in the book. Similarly, Manuel Lima's Books of Circles also explain the data visualization by starting with a quotient that, with endless possibilities for constructing diagrams and charts, why is the circular layout such an exceptionally popular choice for depicting information? This book aims to answer this question in three distinct ways. First, by providing a context for the university of the circular shape as a culture, symbol in all domains of human knowledge across space and time. And by describing a set of perceptual biases identified by cognitive science in recent years, that explain our innate preferences for all things circular. Third, by developing a comprehensive taxonomy of 21 distinct patterns, which showcases the diversity and flexibility of the circular layout. With more than 300 images, this book is a celebration of the enduring appeal of the circle, not just in the realm of, realm of information design, but in every sphere of human expression. If I had to see from the point of view of Scientomedia, Kitty Boner, 2010, in 2010, has written a wonderful book about visualization that makes this field accessible to much larger audiences. That is, Atlas of Science. A planned trilogy of which two books are already published celebrates Scientometrics as the discipline in the background that enables us to visualize the evolution of knowledge as the acumen of, scientific, as the acumen of human civilization. In addition to Garfield and many of other flag bearers, Diderot and D. Ellenberg are prominently mentioned and indeed the book can be read as another encyclopedia. One, adapted for the internet age with its emphasis on access and visualization. The book's focus is wider than these scholarly disciplines and begins with Ptolemy and other classics of building maps. The Heavens and the Sciences had studied them. However, the focus shifts quickly to modern time and the wealth of illustrations make the books attractive for the general audience. Atlas of Knowledge intends to empower anyone to map and make sense of science and technology data to improve daily decision making. And I would end this part of the presentation with a beautiful project related to data visualization by two designers visualizing the mundane details of daily life 
and how our attention shapes our reality. Information is what our world runs on. The blood and the fuel, the vital principle. James Click wrote in his indispensable history how the age of data in human consciousness shaped by the way, this is a very wonderful book, The Information by James. The quality of our attention and the nature of its recorded representation have become the informational infrastructure of our reality. This project, which is now published in the form of a book, Your Data, celebrates the beauty of small data in its deliberate interpretation, analog visualization, and flow transmission. And by the way, this book's foreword is written by Maria Popova, herself a very wonderful collector, or collector of information, right? the, the, the creator of brain picking. So yeah, this thing. And this was the end of this section of data visualization. Now, I would like to draw your attention to this beautiful quote. Everything is connected to everything else. For better or for worse, everything matters. Do small. Right? Okay. Now coming to our last section. Three visual tool knowledge classification system. Let my data set change your mind. So, well, for data extraction and visualization, you can use dimensions, web of science and scopus. By the way, dimensions is there are some specific uh, uh, features which you have to pay for, but dimensions is a very good, uh, what should I say, a, a reliable source, a database, right? In recent age, and it is giving competition to science. So. Right now, in this presentation, I am going to show you how the dimensions work, and later, when you will see the tutorial on works here, I would show in detail how the web of science, how to extract data from web of science and dimensions also. Right? So, only I would here like to show you the screenshots home page. Right? So, this is the thing. Well, by the way, the idea of visualizing geometric networks often referred to as science mapping has received serious attention since the early days of bibliometric research right so and visualization has turned out to be a powerful approach to analyze a large variety of bibliometric networks ranging from networks of bibliographic coupling between two publications or countries to networks right so as you can see the the the, the, the home page of the dimensions where there is uh, firstly you have to log in right then there are filters which are very much are similar to web of science so in that sense dimension is really interesting easy to save and export the files right and easy to filter also yeah so this is really good in that sense and obviously there is an option for was your and site space also and maximum items also you can download is 500 items so that is pretty good and easily can download if in fact you can send it to your mail so that is really good in that sense right this is the excel sheet which looks like publication abstract they don't contain the keywords right they don't contain the keywords so yeah that is a that is a little drawback because there was science and scopus does contain the and there are many more things that I mentioned doesn't contain. So it is not perfect, but it is good to learn uh, as an open source software, right? So in that sense, and so Vosphere is an open source software, right? So uh, those of you who are beginners in this can begin with this dimensions, right? If you don't have currently access of web of science or school. By the way, anyone is interested in uh seeing how the web of science works so obviously he see he or she is, uh, watch my video on possible tutorial but also to mail me i will give my mail id in description uh for the data sets right i will give you the files 
of web of science extracted from web of science so that will be helpful so if you are interested then do mail me uh, by the way my mail id is shivam r461 at the rate of gmail.com so you can check out now coming to the front of was viewers yeah uh, as i earlier said that the use of was viewer as a tool created by the center of science and technology studies lidden university netherlands for the purpose of visualizing the bibliometric networks in different fields these visualization are often called maps right and a researcher can create a network based on the reference in a list of publication which publication journal authors are co-cited or which publication journal authors are related because they share a number of references right so as you can see the main window of osphere main panel option panel information panel pretty simple interface there. right so there is this thing will create where you can add the files extracted from dimension or different databases about was viewer also the manual is given and manual is wonderful please 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 if you are using was viewer if you are starting with was do read the manual right okay now coming to the bibliographic data where you have to create the map so it is easy to create data databases files dimension right there is a pubmed pubmed also pubmed also right so that is also in them but pubmed has its limitations and personally i i i saw many limitations as pubmed so web of science scopus dimensions are good i would prefer not to use pubmed by the way but it's your choice totally easy to insert the files yeah this is the thing this is how it looks bibliographic as you can see keyword analysis are not there so dimension doesn't contain the keyword analysis um, this i would show you in detail right uh, now uh, as i said that visualization has turned out to be a powerful approach and a variety of bibliometric network ranging from network of bibliographic coupling between two publication or countries to networks right so as you can see here uh, many bibliographic data publication here institution categories or the keyword keyword plus. so basically web of science and scopus all contain these data and that's why they are preferred over dimensions or pubmed right so the thing and yeah coming to these specifications a network is a set of items together with the links between the items items are the object of interest items may for example be publications searches or terms represented by a circle by default you can change them into a square right or rectangle it's it's to you but generally it is by default it is a circle uh, a map normally includes only one type of item between any pair of items there can be a link a link is a connection or a relation between two items lines between items represent links right as you can see here each link has a strength represented by a positive numerical value right each link has a strength and it is represented by a positive value right uh, and the links and total link strength attributes indicate respectively the number of links of an item with other items and the total strength of the links of an item with other item right so as here you can see uh, this is this is Netherlands. This is showing item is Netherlands. The cluster is three. Links is two. The, right. The cluster is defined by a distinct color blue. United States is red. United Kingdom in green. Total link strength nine. And documents one. Right. So it is pretty pretty good. Pretty simple also. The higher this value, the value of total link strength and links, the stronger the link. Yeah, obviously. The strength of a link may, for example, indicate the number of cited references two publications have in common. In the case of bibliographic coupling, the number of publications researchers have co authored in the case of co authorship, right? or the number of publications in which two terms occur together in the case of co occurrence. The approach used by this software is distance based, that is, items 
in a bibliometric network are positioned in such a way that the distance between two items approximately indicates the relatedness of items. As you can see, United States and United Kingdom are pretty far from Netherlands, right? So it uh, was where you just a distance based. Do remember, I am going to tell you this in detail in the VOSVIEWER tutorial. So keep patience, it will be published in June. Uh, in general, the smaller the distance between two items, the higher they are related. One of the techniques used by this software for determining the locations of the items is a distance based visualization. Right? That is VOS. That where the, com the name comes, VOS. Visualization of similarities technique. Right. The aim of VOS is to provide a low dimensional visualization in which objects are located in such a way that the distance between any pairs of objects reflect their similarity right, as accurately as possible. Also, in the bibliometric network, there are often larger differences between items in the number of links. As you can see here, the items right, and the analysis, the numbers, the clustering, the resolutions right you can attract or ripple basically the circles the attraction and repulsion the the, the pyramid parameters of the layout are basically defining the distance right you can obviously manipulate the distance and uh, yes was viewer is vulnerable to many so it is up to you to hold your ethics right now Popular items, for instance, representing highly cited publications or highly prolific researchers may have several orders of magnitude, more connection than their less popular count. So basically, this was the overall view of Vosphere, right? The basic thing that Vosphere uses colors to indicate the clusters. Zooming and scrolling functionality allows a map to be explored in full detail in Vosphere. These are the basic tenets, principles of but the main idea of bibliometric network visualization is to allow large amounts of complex bibliographic data to be analyzed in a relatively easy way right by visualizing core aspects of data the strength of bibliometric network visualization is in the simplification it provides and here i would like to thank you thank you for listening do check out my video on intellectual property Right, the leading treaties on intellectual property and intellectual property rights. It discusses the basic tenets of intellectual property. And do check out the next video, which is going to be on Vosphere tutorial. Also, if it would be possible, I would also publish a video on electrochemical CO2 reduction. How I did my research on this and using bibliometric networks and what were the results, what were the findings. And hopefully I will publish. Thank you. Thank you so much for.